Welcome back to Standard Imaging's discussion of metrology and dosimetry topics for the medical physicist. This tutorial is part of a three-part series on the basic principles surrounding measurements with linear accelerators using a variety of detectors such as ion chambers, diodes, and scintillators, along with the associated electrometers. This segment will discuss the important items to consider when performing measurements with a linear accelerator in the clinical setting. Before we begin, let's review the major conclusions from part one of our mini-series. From our initial discussion, you should be familiar with how ion chambers and electrometers function, as well as the basic principles regarding their use in ionizing radiation, such as charge collection, basic signal processing, and leakage assessment. This session will focus on the best practices for acquiring accurate and precise measurements with a basic LINAC setup. In general terms, a radiation dosimeter is any device that is capable of determining a reading which is related to the dose deposited to the sensitive volume of it. There are two types of dosimeters, a reference dosimeter which can directly realize your quantity of interest without requiring calibration, and a relative dosimeter which is what we are most familiar with in the clinical setting and does require calibration in a known radiation field. As we all know, Modern linear accelerator-based radiotherapy relies on accurate dose delivery to the target volume of interest. The ICRU recommends an overall accuracy in the delivered dose to the patient of plus or minus 5%. And when you consider all of the uncertainties involved in this, beginning with those associated in commissioning of your machine, the correction factors which we have to apply to most any measurement we make, all the way up to patient positioning on a day-to-day -day basis, this 5% is not an easy value to achieve. In general, clinical radiotherapy beams are defined by the dose rate at a reference depth in water. Reference dose measurements are most often made using a water phantom, such as standard imaging's dose view 1D or 3D tanks, and an ionization chamber. Solid phantoms can be used as well, although a correction will likely have to be applied if the density deviates from that of water. Typically, thimble chambers are used for high-energy photon beams, and parallel plate chambers are used for high-energy electron beams. Going back to our physics education days, machines are typically calibrated in two setups known as SSD or SAD, with the difference lying in the plane at which the reference field size, typically 10 by 10 centimeters squared, exists. And this is either at the surface or at isocenter, which is normally your depth of D max. As ionization chambers are typically filled with air, we are actually measuring the dose deposited to the sensitive air mass within the chamber. This dose is determined using the expression shown with a conversion of the charge collected over the mass of air multiplied by the W bar over E constant. The mass of air in the denominator is important as it is directly related to the collecting volume of the chamber, which goes back to our previous discussion on why having a fully guarded chamber, which wholly defines the collecting volume, is essential for accurate measurements. From the dose deposited in air, we can convert to a dose to medium, typically water, using cavity theory, such as Bragg-Gray cavity theory or spencer Attucks cavity theory. With cavity theory, the mass of air, or other material if it isn't air, must be accurately known. And for ion chambers used in the clinical setting, this is typically determined through calibration of the chamber response to a known radiation field that is traceable to a national primary standards lab. To delve a little deeper into the intricacies of calibration coefficients, in order for a chamber to be traceable in terms of the typical air karma or absorbed dose to water coefficients, the chamber must have been calibrated directly at a primary lab or at an ADCL or SSDL, or it can be cross-calibrated, which is calibrated against a chamber that has been calibrated at one of these labs. With a calibrated chamber, one then looks to guidelines for making appropriate clinically relevant measurements as a matter of safety to ensure best practices, which in some cases now holds legal status as well. Dosimetry protocols and codes of practice describe procedures to be followed when calibrating a photon or electron beam. The choice of protocol is usually left up to the individual or your department based on jurisdictions, 
These protocols are typically issued by international, national, or regional organizations, such as those shown below. And examples of these protocols would be the AAPM TG51 report, as well as the updates, and the comparable TRS-398 protocol from the IAEA. So now we'll transition to a general description of good practices to achieve accurate and precise measurements using an ion chamber or other detector under a typical LINAC beam. Assuming we have a properly calibrated chamber and electrometer, the first step would be to set up your electrometer. The electrometer should be powered on with a dust cap in place. A minimum of 10 minutes should be allowed for the electrometer to warm up, and this is without any bias applied. After the electrometer is warmed up, select your range of interest and zero the instrument. Next, go into the treatment vault and set up the ion chamber. The chamber should always be handled with care, and be sure to double check your alignment when setting the chamber up in a phantom. You can then connect the chamber cable to a prepared triaxial cable, and what I mean by prepared is to ensure that the cable has been previously unwound such that any static buildup has been allowed to dissipate before being used. Cable coiling effects are detailed in a technical note on the Standard Imaging website if you are interested in learning more, and can also be found at the end of this tutorial. After ensuring your chamber is set up correctly, as well as noting that any cables should be secure and not in the way of a rotating gantry, leave the room and connect the other end of the triaxial cable to the electrometer. Select your desired bias voltage and allow at least 10 minutes for the system to stabilize. Verify the leakage of the chamber is within the acceptable limits. If your leakage is above the expected limits, Remove the bias on the chamber and test the leakage of each system component separately, which is the electrometer, cable, and chamber, as we discussed in part one. If or once your system is stable, go ahead and zero it. You are now ready to take measurements. Select the appropriate Linux settings and take at least three data points to ensure no trending of your values. Analyze your data and apply the necessary calibration and correction factors to get to your final value of interest, which is typically dose. Some examples of correction factors include those for polarity effects, ion recombination effects, detector volume averaging, and energy dependence. Once you are done with measurements, return the bias to zero volts and turn off the electrometer and disassemble the instruments carefully. Diodes are another tool that physicists often use in the clinical setting for output factor measurements or scanning of beam profiles. These instruments also require careful handling and setup. Just like all dosimeters, diodes do have dependencies such as field size, energy, and angular dependence. A very good reference for diode use is the AAPM Report 87, and although it's focused on in vivo measurements with diodes, it still provides an excellent overview of diode characteristics and their use in the radiation therapy setting. So now to summarize, we have covered the basic steps for proper ionization chamber use in the radiation therapy setting, including a careful setup, complete knowledge of how the instrument functions, and any of the associated correction factors which need to be applied. Related to your detector characterization and correction factors, part three of this tutorial series will cover some of the intricacies of measurements in small fields typically used for stereotactic procedures.